my honor to introduce our speakers today. And so if uh, Dr. Teresa Amat of Knox College and Dr. Patrick White of Millican University would come up to our dais. We'll hear remarks from both of our speakers and we should have time for about 15 minutes or so of Q&A and I've got a bunch of great questions already. Uh, Dr. Teresa Mott, the president of Knox College, uh, prior to taking over the presidency at Knox, spent six years as provost and dean of faculty at Hobart and William Smith Colleges in Geneva, New York. She has held academic appointments at Bucknell University, Harvard, the University of Massachusetts in Boston, Amherst, and Wellesley College. She holds a PhD from Boston College and a Bachelor's of Arts from Smith College. Her research, since she's basically an economist, has focused on the labor market experiences of women and people of color. Since she joined the Knox community in July of 2011, she has focused her efforts on the creation and implementation of a strategic plan, Knox 2018, which calls for advancing the college's distinctive approach to liberal education for the 21st century. Over the last five years, Knox has seen record applications for admission and record-breaking fundraising initiatives. The introduction of new academic programs, the renovation of Alumni Hall, a LEED Gold Certified Educational Center, and the opening of a new art center, the Whitcomb Art Center, in January of 2017. Currently, President Amat serves as chair of the Midwest Conference Board of Directors and is a member of the NCAA Division III President's Council, the Executive Committee of the Annapolis Group, and the Board of Directors of the National Association of Independent Colleges and Universities. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Amat. We're also delighted to have with us today the 15th President of Millican University, Dr. <coughs> Patrick White. He joined Millikan as the interim president in July of 2013. And under Patrick White's leadership, Millikan has been revitalized and reimagined. And he has established a solid foundation for growth and success. He spearheaded the successful $85 million Transform Millikan University Capital Campaign, which exceeded its monetary goal 14 months early, 14 months early. And he's led designs for a new transformative series of buildings on campus. Prior to arriving at Millican, Dr. White served seven years as the president of Wabash College in Crawfordsville, Indiana. Dr. White was an English major at the University of Chicago. He was born and raised in Dixon, Illinois the second most famous native of Dixon, <laughs> Illinois. You'll have to figure out who some people say was the first most famous. Prior to uh, joining Wabash College, he served as vice president and dean of faculty at St. Mary's College in Notre Dame, Indiana. We have an alum here? Excellent, okay. He was also formerly the Associate Dean of Faculty from 1988 to 2002 at St. Mary's, served that college as Professor of English. Spearheaded a number of initiatives there. He's also one of the designers of the St. Mary's Center for Women's Intercultural Leadership, which was an Eli Lilly endowment funded initiative. Dr. White and his wife, Chris, who's a certified family nurse practitioner, have two twin daughters, Katie and Molly. Now notice, he spoke, he taught in Notre Dame, Indiana. Guess what his son's name is? Patty. <laughs> Thank you. Catholic Disneyland. 
<laughs> Dr. Ramon, I think you were yes, going to begin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can people hear me in the back? I'm um, <clears throat> recovering like so many of us from, from the flu. Uh, and so I, my apologies if my voice is not uh, as strong as, as it should be. I want to welcome all of you to today's presentation and of course thank the City Club of Chicago and the Associated Colleges of, of Illinois for the opportunity to talk with you uh, today. It's a testimony to the stellar programming of the City Club of Chicago and also the cuisine of Majon is that so many of you are here today to hear two aging baby boomer college presidents <laughs> talk about our favorite topic, which is the virtues of our institutions and the extraordinary contributions that our institutions make, not just to labor force and workforce development, but to the civic life of every community in which we find our graduates. And looking around this room and seeing so many Knox College graduates, um, I knew you would be here. Uh, I knew that wherever two or more are gathered together, there's a Knox alum. Um, and, but I'm very happy to see all of you here and very happy that you can all afford the price of the membership <laughs> in the City Club of Chicago. Um, because, you know, there's kind of a bad rap about liberal arts colleges. Um, some of you may have heard that apparently all of our graduates are living in basements and working as baristas. Um, and uh, I have a PhD in labor economics, which means that I actually engage in an activity called research, <laughs> which leads to the collection and analysis of data, <laughs> right, it's an unusual concept uh, nowadays, um, but we do not engage in data-free uh, analysis. We actually have a pretty good sense of what it is that our institutions, and I speak for all of the Associated Colleges of Illinois, that our institutions are doing for the workforce of Illinois and any other state where they may find themselves. Now at your table, you'll find uh, one of these flyers that lists all of the colleges and universities that are joined in the ACI. If you turn it over, nice little map of Illinois with lots of little circles. And I believe that together, the ACI institutions enroll over 65,000 students here in Illinois. If you are a graduate of one of those institutions, would you raise your hand, please? Just look around. Now, and if you are a barista living in a basement, would you uh, please put your hand down? Because we're, <laughs> we don't own you, right? No. Now, both Patrick and I are products of liberal education. And that is a very broad term. Essentially, the core tenets of a liberal education are that one should be broadly trained that one should have exposure to all of the many different fields of human inquiry and endeavor, and that one should bring to whatever one's field of, es of specialization that breadth of understanding so that you become a fully formed uh, member of the human community. And there are ways to talk about that that I will do as an economist. They will involve charts and graphs my apologies to those of you who are allergic to them, but they will also involve some invoking of the higher qualities of the human spirit. And for that, we will turn to our English PhD, who will do a much better job uh, on that. Um, so we are both products of liberal education, and yet the two of us come to this particular question from very, very different perspectives. I went to college planning to major in modern languages. Uh, my mother is Brazilian, my father's family were Norwegian dairy farmers in Baroque, Wisconsin. Um, and so I lived every day with an intercultural moment. Uh, Brazil and Viroqua, these are, <laughs> these are different places. Um, and so I thought that I should continue my childhood by engaging in conversation in multilingual ways. 
But I went to college in the late 1960s, and some of you may remember the late 1960s. They were a period similar in many ways to the period in which we now live. And I found the analytic power of economics, the way it helped me understand the world, to be so remarkable that I wanted to study more and more of it. And I went on and got a PhD, and that was the beginning of, of my career. Now this is February. This is the time when every college president across the United States is watching the admission numbers, the enrollment numbers. I have a little app, and at 2.30 in the morning it tells me how many people have sent in applications. <laughs> and I wake up at 2.30 every morning and grope for my phone. <laughs> and then I either go back to bed or I stay up. <laughs> depending on that. That task of looking at the admission numbers has been made more difficult for those of us who lead these very fine institutions because we have been on the defensive for some time now. The value proposition of a liberal arts education has been contested. We're going to talk about that today, the value proposition. I will talk about it from an economic perspective, and Patrick will talk about it from the values perspective. But together, we are essentially making the case for the kind of education that, that we were privileged to have and privileged to supply to other, other worthy young people. This is a season when Knox uh, celebrates its founding. We, we were um, created on the prairie in 1837. Uh, by anti-slavery activists who came from western New York to found a town on the prairie at a time in U.S. history when uh, the notion that a town would have an institution of higher learning was such a remarkably distinguishing feature. Our founders were visionaries. Millikan founded in 1901. Again, really a re remarkable histories of these institutions. Now, since then, let's see if we get a, yes, there we go. See, even technology, you can do that with a liberal arts education. <laughs> Since the 19th century or the early 20th century, institutions like Knox and Millikan have educated individuals for economic, social, and civic leadership. What you hear today is that our kind of education is somehow irrelevant. It is precious. It is elitist. It is something that we can't afford because it costs too much. And yet, when you think about the intervening period from our foundings to the present, we have been remarkably enduring institutions. We have been nimble. We have adapted from an agricultural economy, a manufacturing economy, an information economy, a, civ a service economy, the world that we were born into and the world for which we now educate students could not be more different. And yet, these allegedly stodgy institutions, these institutions wedded to the past and trapped in old ways of doing things, have survived and thrived through this period. We know something about disruption. We've managed to survive it. We have come through civil wars, two world wars, endless wars in the 21st century, an economy that was once only, well, it was regional, much less national, and now is global. And yet our institutions survive and thrive, and our graduates have participated in and led major cultural and technological uh, renovation, uh, revolutions. Our business model has survived financial panics, we have survived booms, long periods of stability, and long periods of disruption. And we are nothing if not flexible, nimble, and adaptable. And so are our graduates. But spring brings admission season, and once again, we go through that cycle of justifying to families the kind of education that we, that we provide. Tour guides are walking backwards across our campuses. <laughs> Parents and siblings are trudging grimly through the campus tour. And high school seniors from around the state, from around the country, or in Knox's case particularly, around the world, 
Among liberal arts colleges, we are 14th in the nation for the, the international diversity of our student bodies. These high school siblings try to discern whether our institutions are the right fit for them. Are our institutions the place at which they will find their best future self? Since the Great Recession, as I said earlier, colleges and universities have faced incre increasing scrutiny about the value of higher education. Liberal arts institutions in particular have been criticized, as I said earlier, too costly, we don't prepare students for the workforce, impractical or irrelevant. Now my alumni relations folks prime me with information on where our students are going. And the remarkable thing about that is that our students are going to jobs that did not exist when they went on that admission tour. So somehow, some mysterious alchemy of what happens at our institutions where uh, faculty nurture and mentor young people and help them find a future that we cannot chart to this day, somehow those students graduate and go on and create a new world. The evidence has been very, very clear. I followed as a college president over the last two decades, but if you go back to the work that I did as a graduate student, it was very clear that higher education pays a remarkable return. And that our graduates are sought after by employers because they bring the skills of the future into the workforce. Here are a few uh, results of employer surveys. And there's a lot going on on this, on this graph, and I don't expect uh, people to absorb it all at, all at once. The key point here is that employers are interested less in what a student majored in than in the fact that they have a combination of specialization and breadth. It is that combination that is the special alchemy of a liberal arts institution. You learn how to focus on one thing and learn it well, but you are always looking at your major, your field of expertise in this broader context. And that broader context enriches the major and allows you to take those learnings into the future. Now, what are the learning outcomes that they are most interested in? This is, comes as no shock to you. One of our uh, board members, who, by the way, did work uh, for, for Starbucks, um, he was the chief people officer for Starbucks, um, and did actually hire people. He will tell you that right now, he's now with Zillow, another digital firm, a firm that didn't exist when he graduated from Knox College, for sure. And he will tell you that this is what they're looking for. They're looking for graduates who have both oral and written communication skills. They're looking for graduates who can work effectively with teams, and especially now with diverse teams. We know from all the research that diverse teams, where people bring different perspectives to the table, produce better problem solving, they are more creative, and they're more innovative. And our students who are on our campuses and daily interacting with people not like them work really well in diverse teams. Um, a friend of mine, and I'm not going to credit this because he doesn't, he probably doesn't want anybody to know he would say this, but he would point out that unless you are convicted of a felony, uh, the likelihood is that you will never be forced to share a room with someone you didn't select. <laughs> this is what we do to first year students. <laughs> You can see why he doesn't want to be credited with that remark. Um, former college president. But there's something to that. There is something to being told here in, at what we, at Knox, for example, we house people in suites. And so when you walk in, your roommates might be from Dixon, but also Lagos, maybe London, maybe Portland. Maybe Galesburg, maybe Chicago, maybe Wilmette, maybe Dallas. That's your roommate group. That's your friend group. 
And as a result of that, you emerge from that education with a capacity to work in diverse teams that very, very few people have. You'll see the other skills here, ethical judgment and decision making, clearly very, very important. Um, analytical thinking, critical thinking, and applying your knowledge skills to, to the real world. Other things that employers look for, the ability to solve complex problems, what in design thinking now are referred to as wicked problems. A wicked problem is a problem you don't even really know what information needs to be brought to bear to solve it. The, the parameters of the solution may come from fields of inquiry that are not obviously apparent. So solving wicked problems, which involves the creativity to ask, is the answer to this somewhere else, somewhere I haven't already looked? That's something that liberal arts graduates can do. Locate and evaluate information, be innovative, be current on technologies. Now, employers are telling us that they do want our graduates to have applied skills. And I can tell you that every liberal arts college that I know has significantly expanded its use of internships, undergraduate research, study abroad, community-based learning, all of these ways in which people can take their skills and translate them into the real world. These were not pedagogies that were in, in effect when I went to a liberal arts college. But today, and Patrick is smiling at me, this is how we teach. We take our students out of the classroom and we put them in places where they can use their learning right away. Not, we don't wait till they graduate. We do this almost on day one. So every college has expanded its use of these pedagogies. Now, what I want to talk about at, in closing is the future. What does the future look like? Two very, very good labor economists uh, that I, I would encourage that you uh, look to. You may see them in the New York Times. They'll write op-eds, et cetera. We're in a great book called Dancing with Robots. And they're looking into the future. And they're asking, in a world in which many, many tasks can now be handed over to computers, what is the role of humans? What is the human-powered economy of the future? And it comes back to some of the things that I mentioned about wicked problems. Computers are terrible at wicked problems. They are terrible at addressing unstructured problems. Computers are terrible at knowing what they do not know. So are some people. <laughs> but we're good at that too. We're very good at humiliating you and showing you that there's a lot you don't know and maybe you better figure out how to get it. Computers are hard at seeking out new information and figuring out who has that information. What is the social interaction that will yield that information to you? And computers cannot undertake non-routine manual tasks, like folding laundry, um, which is good, because that means that there will always be a future for um, people like me who love to fold laundry because it is about the only thing I can do that's actually finished when I, well, at least for the day. But there are many things that the labor market requires of us and that our educations um, allow us to do. This is a little graph about that and really all you need to know is that the number of jobs that require working with new information and solving unstructured problems, those are the ones that are growing. The jobs that require more routine and, and routinized skills, those jobs are shrinking. Now, this is the thing I mentioned before, but note the thing at the end here, which is we really believe that we prepare young people the best for the future by preparing them for jobs that do not even exist today. Here are some jobs that didn't exist 10 years ago. An app developer. Until the iPhone, there were no apps. Right? Now there are app developers. Social media managers. I bet there's not a major company represented in this room that does not have somebody 
managing your social media. Not a job that existed 10 years ago. And you can go through these. The driverless car engineer. Uh, not a job that existed five years ago, six years ago. A sustainability manager. Many of our companies now uh, have someone who is dedicated to the question of being a sustainable organization. The one I like is the millennial generational expert. <laughs> I personally need these people. <clears throat> they are our vice presidents for student affairs and they help translate to me a generation that, um, that I don't fully understand. Um, someday, I'm, I, but personally, I'm going to find a job. My next job will be as baby boomer uh, managers. I'm going to explain the baby boomer generation to the millennials uh, because you have to take care of us as we, get, as we get older. So what is the future going to look like? Just about done. What is the f last slide. What is the future going to look like? The future is going to look like this. There will be a diversifying educational and credentialing environment. Many, many different kinds of schools, colleges, universities, credentials, badging. But I can assure you that in that new environment, there will still be liberal arts institutions because of what we do to, cre to create lifelong learners, self-directed learners. And I wanted to finish on just one note about this. The City Club of Chicago actually is part of that ecosystem of lifelong learning. And one of the reasons there's so many Knox graduates and Millikan graduates and graduates of ACI schools in this room is because all of you were trained to want to learn more. None of you thought your education ended when you walked across a stage. Every one of you recognized that as the world changed, you needed to go out and get new information, hear new perspectives, and keep educating yourself. I salute the City Club for doing that, and I look forward to our humanist uh, colleague here who will talk about the values that really matter. Thank you. Thank you, President Amat, and now President uh, White of Millican University. Thank you, Ed, and thank you, Teresa. President Ahmad has laid out the role that liberal arts colleges and universities play in the historical and current needs of the economic life of our nation. My role today is to explore with you further what we do, indeed, how we accomplish so much for our students. What is it about the liberal arts character of the colleges of ACI that makes us so successful in preparing students who become leaders, change agents, innovators, and valuable team members, and citizens with the skills and tools that employers demand and our city, the country, and the world need. These skills go by different names, of course, as Teresa has shown, but everybody could construct a list of, that looks something like this. Valuable skills, okay, you've seen lists like this all the time. Critical thinking, problem solving, communication, collaboration, management, and we could probably add 30 or 40 more. And Teresa's review of a number of surveys shows that these and other skills not only are developed, but they're valued. There's no institution of higher ed learning anywhere in the country that doesn't say they value these skills. No one's gonna say, oh, we don't care whether our students write well you know, no matter what kind of institution you are. But the ACI schools are particularly adept at teaching these skills, in part because we do not stop at the skills itself, but go beyond to the dispositions and habits of mind that put these skills and many more into action every day. What do I mean by this? I think profoundly that it is not enough to have these skills but to be a truly valuable colleague and an adept citizen, you have to have the dispositions. Teresa mentioned those of you who are here today uh, coming to this. You could have the skills and interest, but do you really act on that? You have to have the habits of mind, heart, and spirit that with different names and each in their own ways, our colleges encourage. Let's look at some of these. 
Habits of mind, heart, and spirit, such as self-knowledge, ambition and motivation, and so on. Resilience and self-reliance. Think about it. To have the ability to write well, but not have the disposition to do that, whether one calls that disposition a work ethic or ambition, is to be less than a complete person and a valued asset to an organization. We have all known people in our careers who have had the skills but did not perform. At our ACI institutions, we want our students to leave our colleges with the self-knowledge that they can be successful and to have the ambition to take on more and the habits of exercising these various virtues. At the ACI colleges, we educate and motivate students to be actors, players, agents in their lives and the lives of their communities and companies. A nice boast, but how do we do that? Institutions, I feel profoundly, often misname their excellence. If you asked any of our students at the ACI colleges what makes their place special, she her, or he would probably say something like this. We're small, we're friendly, we really care about our students. And you know what? You really get to know the faculty. <laughs> All that is true. But so what? What difference does this make? This response it is at fault because it tends to make us sound, our institution sound, like cozy little refuges. Sometimes students will say, I came to Millican or Knox because I knew I would get lost at the University of Illinois, or even Western. <laughs> that makes us sound like a haven or a refuge from the rough and tumble of the adult life, a time for prolonged adolescence. But the reality of our institutions is very different. The size of the ACI colleges and universities does not create a cocoon or a shelter, but in one sense their insight is right. It is easier to be lost at the University of Illinois or Northern Illinois University than at Knox or Millican. Indeed, in the small college environment, you cannot hide, and therefore, it's not a refuge. Our schools are not refuges by any means. More, think of them as human-sized arenas in which every student is important. Every student has the ability to matter, to make a difference, to own his or her individual and particular experiences. Our colleges are theaters for students' growth and development. What does that mean? And how does that affect what our students become? One very important thing, every company or organization, everybody here as business people or people in government wants is people who will act like grown-ups. <laughs> this seems simple enough, and we're not putting posters up on the interstate saying, come to Milliken, here's where you learn how to be a grown-up. That probably would not be a good campaign. But how much of our communal and business lives are spent dealing with people who are not behaving well, who lack the skills and habits that we might expect of adults in our society? To have the maturity and sense of self to get to work, be dependable, get the job done. These may seem like trivial or even first level skills, but we all know how difficult true excellence can be without them. There's probably not well, there's probably 50% of the people in the room have dealt with some of these problems already this morning. People not behaving well. So how does the size and intimacy and kind of teaching that goes on at a liberal arts college or university makes a difference? When a student arrives at Millican or Knox or any of our ACI colleges, she is constantly being both supported and challenged. This is important led to become something more than she thought she could be. At Millican, I say to all prospective students, I know one thing about each and every one of you in the room today, and that is you have no idea how good you are. And I believe that as we all do in the ACI colleges. The first year class at the University of Chicago might have a pretty good sense of their excellence. 
but at our smaller, less famous liberal arts colleges, students come to us ready to be surprised by their possibilities and astounded by what they can do. They might be hot stuff in Payne, Illinois, or in a large high school in the south suburbs, or in a city school in Chicago, but they wonder. They do not know how good they are. At ACI schools, our students matter. Their individual growth, change, and development into maturity matters to their teachers, to their administrators, and to their fellow students. And we are not just preparing students for true engagement later on. We are asking, leading, guiding, and teaching them to exercise leadership in the here and now, moral character in the here and now, and knowing who they are right now. It is not enough to say we will figure that out later. As soon as we say to a student leader who's coming to us to change something, as often happens, oh, well, we're, uh, we wanted you to be leaders, but we wanted you to do that after you went to law school and when you turned to be 35 or 36. We don't want you to bother us with this noise. As soon as we do that, we betray our mission as a liberal arts college. We have to listen, we have to understand, we have to work with these students. I recently ran into an alumna who graduated a year ago and is a graduate student at the University of Missouri-St. Louis in biology, and I asked her how she's doing. I said, do we prepare you well? She's a matter of fact you, woman from uh, Red Bud, Illinois. Sure, she answered. <laughs> My teachers are amazed that I've already done research. My fellow students are surprised that I can talk about my work and describe how I'm thinking through a problem or a laboratory. She's astounded that this is special. And she says to them, didn't you have to do that in your undergraduate research, she asks, and they say, what undergraduate research? Of course I can talk about my work, she says. Didn't you have small classes where your attendance would be noticed and where you had to talk out what you were thinking? Many of her colleagues have not had that experience. In this kind of environment, students are not waiting for graduate school over their jobs or to take on the real hard work of education. In our worlds, our students are encouraged and supported to take risks, do things they haven't done, to be empowered and encouraged. Not just because the teachers are brilliant or the coaching staff cares about them deeply or the student development people are working to get them involved. It is because the students learn early and often what they're doing matters to their teachers, their colleagues, and their university or college. They become agents of their own excellence, and in so doing, act out their lives in brave and bold ways. You do not make people confident by saying, you're wonderful, you're winsome, you're radiant. You make people confident by giving them tasks that are difficult and having them succeed at that. In this world and atmosphere, students are pushed to grow up faster, and this matters especially in a world where there are so many young people prolonging their adolescence as employees even, and children relying on parents or immediate gratification of a rewarding job early on. Dr. Mott and I could tell you story after story of students who start companies, head off in new directions, begin doing major research in science and technology, and then wonder why doesn't everybody else do that. You may not know this, but the small liberal arts schools of our country have been for years the largest breeding ground for PhDs in the sciences. Because in these worlds, students have the experience that bring them the habits of mind, heart, and spirit that give them the confidence and the creativity to succeed. So it is not just that we're small and wonderful and friendly. We are that. We are that. But what our, it's what our size and our commitment to the liberal arts enables us to see and do. We often think of the liberal arts as a listing of particular courses. Have you had a class in philosophy or have you had a class in rhetoric? As an English professor, I'm not going to say that it's not important to have students who know Shakespeare. But one can know Shakespeare and not have any touch of a liberal arts experience with Shakespeare if all you're doing is knowing the rote memory of the plays and the characters in those plays. But it is far more important to have students in whatever courses they take gain the largeness of mind and heart that comes from confronting large issues, complex problems, and the ambiguities of human experience. In an environment where what they think about these things matters to everybody around them. 
The death of education is when students, not when students say, I don't want to learn, it's when they say, I'll know, I'll care, and walk away from the discussion. Studying Shakespeare is a great way to teach that, but not the only way. The liberal arts have changed since the medieval trivium and quadrivium, and it's not just that students know their faculty, it is how knowing their faculty enables them to expand the kinds of conversations we can have. In my previous institution, Wabash College, there is a center for the study of liberal arts. And through research over many years, the Wabash National Study of the Liberal Arts found out that it is not a particular curriculum, nor a particular way of teaching, nor even that students have conversations with their faculty that make a difference. It is the kind of conversations they are having with their faculty and their uh, college or university leaders. It is not just the faculty are saying to students, how about those Olympics? Or discussing how they did on the midterms. That's just being nice and sociable. It is when the conversation verges into, what are you gonna do with your life? Or have you tried this or that? Or, you know, this paper was really pretty good, but I know you can do a lot better. To do that, you have to reach into the hands, to, into the life of your students, up to your elbows. And that's a very, very scary proposition. But we do it all the time. Because then the conversation becomes life-changing. The conversations become grown-up conversations. These adult, thoughtful conversations are what changes the lives of students. And they happen at our institutions because we challenge and support in ways that make a difference. Both are crucial. We set up expectations for excellence. We tell our students they'll succeed and then show them how. And we have confidence in them. If it is all support, no one is challenged. If it is all challenge, everyone winds up neurotic with a profound sense of failure. And through this intense challenge and support, we've practiced what might be called the liberal arts conversations. And they've been conversations for thousands of years. Who am I? What matters? Who cares? What difference can I make? Then the virtues and habits of mind that you see in our graduates can come alive. This is noble and exciting work, and it happens every day at our ACI colleges and universities. One last thing I want to mention, and Teresa alluded to this as well, but it's very central and important. It is not just what we do, but how we do it, and also, who are our students? Time was people would think that the only fortunate or the wealthy would go to a small liberal arts college. That might have been true at one time, but it might be true, and it might be true at some bastions of privilege today. But at the ACI colleges, our student bodies are increasingly diverse and increasingly in need of financial support. The medium household income for families of students at the University of Illinois is over $100,000. The medium household income at a Knox or a Millican is closer to 50,000, and many of our students are eligible to Pell Grants. A significant percentage of our students have estimated family contribution on the FAFSA, you all know what that is, estimated family contribution of less than $4,000. A number of our students at all our colleges have estimated family contributions of zero. Families with nothing to contribute to their education. Our students are borrowing and all our schools spend a significant amount of our resources in enabling students to come close to affording the kind of education we have extolled this morning. So in that regard, the ACEI institutions are serving our highest aspiration as a nation and a democracy, and our work really matters. If you look at the slide of attributes, which I've left up here, you will see they have an old-fashioned 19th century ring to them. This is intentional on my part, because the liberal arts colleges and universities of the ACI may have the most up-to-date majors and spiffy programs and facilities. Knox is building a new addition to their science halls. But our work is very much in the American grain. The liberal arts colleges are a distinctly American invention and foster values, skills, and habits of mind vital for a democracy and inherent in American experience. Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote an essay 
entitled Self-Reliance. Thoreau would applaud our commitment to resilience and self-knowledge. The American traditions of learning are alive in our ACI colleges. We are doing the work that needs to be done to take all of us into a future that is worthy of our highest imagination of what we can be as a state, a country, and a world. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. White, and once again, thank you, Dr. Amat. By the way, you know, this was a very interesting discussion, and if you didn't take all of it down because you didn't take Gregor Pittman, I don't even know what Gregor Pittman is. Okay, shorthand, unbelievable. Okay, uh, go to WGN Radio's podcast because within about an hour or two, this program will be available on podcast. Okay, we have a number of questions here. We have just a few minutes. This is from uh, Peter Scozzi with the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railway. Pete, where are you? Okay, good. This is to uh, Dr. Amat. What programs does Knox offer to train railroad workers? Please speak to your partnership with BNSF. I did take the train to get here, <laughs> um, if, that, if that counts. <clears throat> um, I, I would say that places like Knox have historically trained people in technological fields as the next step. So we do not offer an engineering major, but we do offer 3-2 programs where a student would start at Knox and then complete an engineering program. Um, and if you look at our uh, alumni base, you will see that uh, there are people over the years who have worked on the business side of transportation, utilities, technology, uh, etc. cetera. Um, I think that that's really back to this question of what is the future? How do you prepare people for the future? I think the kinds of technologies that will be the future of rail will be developed by students who are emerging from all of our institutions now. And they will develop those, those new technologies. Um, we are a railroad town, uh, Galesburg. The, the railroad is our largest employer. Um, we have, over the years, had many, many students come to us by rail. And so we uh, have, I would say that we have been fed by the rail um, and we have tried to give back to the rail through the ways in which our students will move on into the emerging technologies of the, of the future and the business uh, of, of rail, the business of rail as well. I don't know, Patrick. Okay, thank you, you very answer. much. Um, I'd like to direct a question to Dr. White now. We had a question directed at Knox. This is directed at your university, Millican. Leah Jones, who's with Olson and Gage. She graduated in 1999. There seems to be an even greater divide between liberal arts and STEM. How can we convince college-bound students to study both? How do we convince employers that philosophy grads excel in IT? I think by talking to the students who have graduated and are doing that work and find out what uh, prompted uh, some of their decision making and some of their work. Um, we have a lot of students, we're, we're working very, very hard to recruit STEM students at, at Millican. Uh, and they, uh, some of them uh, start off as math majors and then become philosophy majors. Why? Because they're, they're interested in some of those sort of larger questions. That doesn't mean they lose their math abilities. Mm -hmm. uh, but to help people see that it's, uh, I, would, I would talk to employers and, and help them see that with their own employees, it's not just one thing or another. Anything to the, that puts up a kind of either or dichotomy uh, can lead to all kinds of complexities uh, that are not good. Okay, good. Uh, this is from one of our speakers, a member of the I think the Knox College Board of Directors, 1984. 
Lawrence Massau with the Civic Federation. Questions really directed at both of you. <clears throat> Is being located in Galesburg and or Decatur an advantage or disadvantage to the college's future? Now there's a little second part here. Mm -hmm. What could the state of Illinois do better to help ACM colleges? Um, when I when I came to Decatur uh, five years ago, um, I s got a lot of attention at a Chamber of Commerce luncheon when I said what I thought was a pretty obvious demographic fact, and that is Millican is Decatur's university. And Millican is the only university in town. We have a, a, a strong community college. It seems to me that that was just a fact. But for many years, Millican had been seen by people in the community as being something other, something not connected to, to the town. Um, and I think at Knox, we're also a big railroad town. Uh, we're also very much connected with um, the uh, farming industries throughout the uh, Midwest uh, with ADM, Tate and Lyle, and other organizations, and of course, Caterpillar in town. And one of the things we're trying to do constantly is find ways in which we can support the growth and development of economic development of Decatur. Uh, both of us, I'm sure, Teresa, you are involved in the economic development in Galesburg. It's, it's a part of our force because colleges and universities can play an important role in, in the economic development of their, of, their, of their cities. What can the state do? Boy, I'll defer to Teresa on that one. I, you know, okay, I Teresa, find, Carl Sandberg find, says, find some what more can money the state do? I believe, if you can. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I think is happening in many of our communities is a, a, a talent um, exodus. I believe there is a, a, a program coming up on the exodus from, from Illinois. Uh, we know that the state of Illinois is exporting more of its uh, college-bound youth than any other state in, in the country. Doesn't help that our neighboring states are offering in-state tuition to Illinois youth who go to Missouri or Iowa or Wisconsin. Um, but I, I do think that uh, we have tried to open up opportunities for our students to see entrepreneurial activities in this community, that they can actually stay in Galesburg and start a company uh, a small company, because the scale of the operation in a small community is often a great place to begin and a great place to grow. But there are very few programs that are aimed at that kind of entrepreneurialism for young people in these communities. And I'd love to see opportunities that would open up and that would help these first-time entrepreneurs uh, select areas of the state that have not been historically seen as the hip place to come and start a new high-tech company. And, and one of the things that we do extraordinarily well, as I mentioned in, the, uh, in my talk, is that we literally encourage students, students who have the chutzpah, the talent, and even sometimes the foolishness to think they're going to start a company. And they do it, and they have success, and they then wind up turning around, employing people in the community, and uh, changing aspects of the lives of, of, of people in our communities. In fact, uh, we had a question here, uh, Dr. White, um, right along that line from Anthony Labello, who's with the Smith Group JJR. He wants to know if each of you could mention a successful alum who obtained that liberal arts education, but has become a leader in Unre an unrelated field. Um, one of our, we, we, Millican is famous for a lot of things, but one thing that we are very successful at is uh, our nationally recognized programs in musical theater. 20% mm -hmm. uh, of our students are music or theater majors, and musical theater major is ranked uh, among the top 10 of programs all over the country. One of our most successful alums in musical theater is not doing musical theater any longer. He started out as a song and dance man. Then he got into uh, Manhattan residential real estate. 
<laughs> he's now on our board of trustees, and he's doing pretty well, thank you. And But he, it, this isn't, oh my goodness, I woke up in my 30s and decided I wanted to make a lot of money. What he did was decide to recognize that everything he learned about how to organize, how to direct, how to perform in for musical theater was transferable to sales and to um, residential real estate. Um, that is that is one example of of one person uh, making quite a bit of switch from the arts uh, to um, a business. Okay, and uh, President Amat, the story from Knox? Well, I gave the one example of the person working at Zillow. Um, there is someone sitting in this room who probably did not imagine that they would become involved in real estate development in the city of Chicago while they were at uh, Knox. Uh, Susan Zucker and her husband Paul Zucker, again, a sort of a real estate development story. Uh, didn't major in real estate, last I checked. Um, but maybe it was that remarkable roommate thing, made you just want to house people, was the, the thing that did that. I don't know. Okay, we have time. We have, we have uh, three uh, last questions. Um, several are related. And they sort of point to the fact that um, when we think of liberal arts, for many people it's politically charged, has a negative connotation regarding job prospects. What do you think can be done to change that negative connotation? Well, we hope we did a little bit of that here tonight, um, today I should say. Uh, it was a, frankly a friendly audience, just, just for the record. I mean, I, I could think of audiences in which much of what we said might have been less well received. But what is the point there? The point is that many of you have had that experience and do not need to be persuaded. Serve as our ambassadors. <laughs> Use your own experience. Talk to others, maybe uh, neighbors, friends, people who are thinking about their own uh, sons and daughters' future and show them how the path that you took from a liberal arts institution, and, and by the way, the term art, uh, you know, we probably produce more PhDs in STEM fields than other institutions do. So we've always had, we've always been the liberal arts and sciences, every single one of us. 60% of students who come to Knox come because they're interested in a STEM field. So the notion that we are a humanities curriculum um, it's, 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 just a, it's a much more complicated picture. But I would ask that all of you who um, have had experiences of your own of this remarkable path, start here, go there, share that experience with others. Thank you, and Dr. White? I would, I would, also, I would also invite you to, um, to think about the people you know who admired, whether you admire, whether they went to a small college or a liberal arts college or not. <laughs> but who have the kind of um, attributes of heart, mind, and spirit that, are, that, that I spoke about. Um, these are the people you want in your companies. These are the people you, who are moving forward. Um, and Teresa has said this uh, eloquently to me and we, as we prepared for this. Um, we prepare people not for their first job, but for their third job. We prepare people for their careers. We prepare people for a life of meaning and value that makes a difference, um, and and it's 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 that complication, complicated mixture of skills, habits of mind, and a disposition that will enable you to take on interesting tasks. These are the kind of people you want in your companies and in your businesses. When I was a pup growing up in Dixon, Illinois. I thought, well, you know, I, I'm going to get pretty educated and everything's going to become pretty simple. Wrong. You know, the more you know, and I think you know this in your lives and in your work, the more you know, often the more complicated the world is. And we need people who can handle, tolerate, be nimble and flexible before the slings and arrows, to quote the bard, of complexity that's going to be coming at them throughout their lives. Well, thank you, Dr. White. Thank you, uh, President Amat. Let's give them a big round of applause. Now.